Let's move on to the next major section of the notes. As we saw within the Torah the, as a whole, the most exciting part of the discussion of that is the literary structure. The structure of the book, the structure of this first part of, uh, of the Torah. Now, one of the things I've, I've begun with is what I call the literary frame of Genesis. That, uh, that Genesis is a self-contained unit within the Torah as a whole. It is, as we saw last week, the first major division of the Torah. It gives the prehistory of the nation of Israel. The foundation of, and without Genesis, I mean, there is no Exodus through Deuteronomy. All right, that, that uh, this is the foundation. This is the prehistory. What Israel needs to know to understand, you know, what happened in the first generation of the nation's history, which, as we saw last week, because of length, obviously, is much more important in the Torah. Than, uh, than the prehistory. But nevertheless, this is the, the prehistory, and so we're going to see some very definite uh, echoes in the introduction of the book, and, uh, and uh, then uh, toward the end of, uh, of the book, uh, some of that uh, re-echoing. For instance, the, uh, the book begins in the beginning. And uh, usually within the, uh, the Torah and throughout the rest of the Old Testament, that uh, beginning is, is a usually very closely correlated in context with the end. In other words, events begin and events end. A day begins, a day ends. A week begins, a, day, a, a week ends. A year begins, a year ends. A life begins, a life ends. Uh, and, uh, and so when we think in terms of a beginning, all right, so you look back at the beginning, this is, uh, this is what God establishes, and a beginning assumes an end, and we already saw that last week, that in the beginning, and there are seven days, and then at the end, chapter 49, Assemble yourselves, and I may tell you what will befall you at the end of the days. So we might put it this way, that in creation, at you know, the very beginning, chapter 1, through chapter 2, verse 3, we see the beginning and the beginning, which is, if I might put it this way, the beginning of days, the beginning of the seven days. And then at the very end of Genesis, we have, well, where is, where is this all going to culminate? That which began in Genesis 1 is going to culminate with the revelation that is given in Genesis 49. There is the beginning and there is the end. And, uh, and uh, again, certainly we, uh, we see, uh, as we saw last week in 49.28, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father said to them when he blessed them. The final word, the final revelation, the end of the days, is a word of blessing. Right? What did God do with the man that he created at the end of uh, chapter 1? <clears throat> he blessed them. It says, subdue the earth, rule over it. Now, as we see this literary frame, that's the beginning. This is what God established. This was his desire through creation to bring about a ruling and subduing through man. This is blessing. He blessed them, chapter 1. He blesses at the end of the days. This is how he's going to bless the, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel blessed them, everyone, with a blessing appropriate to him. 
and then call them obviously to bury him in the, in the right way. But interestingly, there's this concept of subdue the earth and rule over it, picked up in a very important passage in chapter 49, when he says he gets to Judah. 49.10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs. To him shall be the obedience of the peoples. That there's going to be this one in the line of Judah who is going to be the ultimate ruler, who's going to subdue the enemies and bring about obedience. And with this obedience of the peoples will finally come, you know, God's rule and reign that uh, he spoke about at the very beginning in his initial blessings. So in these blessings with which Israel blessed, Jacob blessed his sons, we hear echoes going back to, to Genesis chapter 1. It's interesting that we'll talk about this as far as the structure, but the Toledot of the heavens and the earth is the very first Toledot. And the last Toledot is the Toledot of Jacob. It's within that Toledot, that first Toledot, we're introduced to disobedience. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, within the Toledot of of, uh, of Jacob, of, of Israel, we see the sin of the sons of Israel. That, uh, that leads to exile from the garden on the part of Adam, which leads to the departure of the sons of Israel from the land in <coughs> chapter 46. Interestingly, we're introduced in chapter 3 to an animal that deceives. Yet interestingly, this one who is going to come from Judah is pictured as a lion in chapter 49. Tying that together, chapter 3, chapter 49, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the snake, and the king from Judah will dominate over his enemies. Interesting in that very first Toledot, Cain kills his brother. At the very end, and uh, interestingly, Cain, the unrighteous one, kills his brother who bought, brought an acceptable offering to the Lord. But Joseph, Israel's savior is the one who forgives his brothers. It's, it's interesting that, uh, that in the very first Toledot, we see, uh, we see inter-family um, warfare. We see inter-family strife. In the last Toledot, we see inter-family strife. So uh, echoes of uh, the beginning that uh, are picked up at uh, the end of, uh, of Genesis. So these, these are some of the echoes that uh, you know, show us that, uh, that uh, obviously we are dealing with, with a, once again, a, a literary unit here at, uh, at uh, what we call the book of Genesis. There's, uh, again, as the, uh, the very first uh, division of the Torah, you know, it has its own coherence, it has its own unity, not, not how it lays the foundation for that which comes later as well. It, it is, in a sense, just like you know, other segments of uh, other books of uh, Scripture, it, uh, it, has its, uh, it has its unity and coherence within the, uh, within the microstructure as well as at the macro level as well. Well, moving on ahead as we get then to, to think in terms of the structure, I'm going to jump ahead in uh, the notes. If, you're, if you got it uh, 
uh, paper wise just uh, you know uh, move uh, move over a page if you're scrolling down scroll down on the, the notes to the selected interpretive issues and the very first one I put there is the literary structure it is almost universally agreed almost which means it's not totally it's almost universally agreed that the the key to the structure of uh, this first portion of the Torah is in the term toledot. Sometimes in, in, um, in commentaries you'll see it with an H, so that's why I put the H bracket at the end. Uh, in uh, the, uh, the world and the word and how I would use it would uh, would be without the H at the end, uh, Tolada. But uh, uh, but a number of years a number of years ago, I had a student who was looking at another commentary and um, said that they're using another word. Well, they're not using another word. They're just transliterating the word differently with that final H. So I decided I better, for the sake of clarification, add that to the notes. That uh, when when you see a commentator speak about <coughs> In English, the Toledoth. Uh, he, he's talking about the Toledoth that we are speaking about here in uh, in class. So, majority position is it's organized by these Toledoths and uh, translated basically into English, the generations of. Now, some will say the Toledot is not the key to the structure. The key to the structure is the narrative that concentrates upon certain narrative characters in the book. Now, since everyone sees a major break somewhere in chapter 11 to 12, that too is somewhat debated, but uh, most see it right. That is at 11:26 and 11:27. That is the right. That is the right exegesis, by the way. Um, so, Adam and Noah, and and it's true. We talked about it last week. That really, you know, you can look at Genesis 1 to 11 and basically see a narrative about Adam followed by a narrative about Noah. Uh, joined together by a genealogy and small narrative in chapter uh, 5, 1 through 6, 8. And uh, then after Noah, uh, another uh, genealogy and narrative, chapter 10, 1 through 11, 9. And then finally the genealogy of, uh, of 11, 11 through 26. But uh, but even that structure would lead some to say, see, the major emphasis is upon Adam and then Noah. It's, it's, it, it's, it's biography. And then certainly we have the final three major narrative individuals, Abraham, Jacob, uh, slash Israel, and uh, Joseph. So here once again are, you know, the key narrative individuals. Uh, we looked at Abraham, Noah, Abraham and Jacob, Israel last week, and now you would include the fact that uh, the major narrative individual, even though Jacob is still alive, Israel is still alive and interacting, obviously, with his sons. Throughout Genesis 37 to, to 50, he doesn't die until chapter 50, as far as uh, the narrative is concerned, but uh, Joseph obviously becomes the, uh, the key narrative individual in uh, this uh, last section of the book. But as you look at it, organized by biographical material doesn't change most of the divisions a whole lot uh, from the Toledot structure. That um, the first five Toledots are basically what tells the story of Adam and Noah. The, uh, the sixth major Toledot in the book is what tells the story of Abraham. And uh, the eighth major Toledot is what tells the story of Jacob. And the tenth major Toledot is what tells the story of Joseph. Um, so I don't think uh, uh, you can say that uh, just by breaking it down biographically, 
is in some way that distinct from uh, breaking it down by, by Tolada. And as you can see from the notes, uh, I do break the structure of the book down, as does the, uh, the World and the Word on uh, page 174 by this uh, Toledot structure. Now having said that, what about the term Toledot? How is it being used? So even though it's almost universal agreement, all right, this is the key to the structure of this first division of the Torah, how do we understand Toledot? Well, here are the term. These are the generations. Generations of Toledot basically has the idea that which is generated, that which is begotten, that which is you know, brought, as it were, to life. And so I would go along with the vast majority of the commentators, which is Toledot introduces a major section. Some, using extra biblical uh, evidences, say, well, Toledot was the way in which you know, particularly genealogies in the ancient Near East were brought to an end. And so a Toledot is the conclusion. The conclusion of a section, not the beginning. Matthew's an excellent commentary on Genesis. Says you have to look within context. Sometimes it functions as a conclusion. Sometimes it functions as an introduction. And of course, the, uh, the key passage that is, well, is first gone to is chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. This is the, this is the written document that includes the generations, the Toledot of Adam. And it's true, this is a unique way of phrasing the Toledot. Usually it's just the Toledot, the generations of. And then the, uh, the individual's name is given. The other place that uh, those who would try to say that it at times can be used as a conclusion is in chapter 2, verse 4. The Toledot of the heaven and the earth when they were created. Grammatically can be taken as its own stand alone statement followed by in the day that the Lord made heaven and earth no shrub in the field was yet in the earth. Even though that is possible, it is not grammatically probable. So once again, I think even though some would argue the possibility that uh, uh, 2 4 a sums up what went before, it is better to see it as introducing what comes after. Some would say that Toledot has different meanings. Sometimes referring to basically historical account, the book of the, the generations of Adam, a, a written document. Uh, I, and again, we do not want to practice evangelical source criticism. I don't know whether Moses had a book before him that included what is in 5.1 through 6.8. Um, or whether he is just saying, all right, that he is the one writing now about the generations that came from Adam. But, uh, but I wouldn't see it as a different meaning. I think in each case that what is being said here is not that this is a new account, but this is an account of what was generated by the individual that is being spoken of. And Significantly, uh, we find out, particularly as we take a look at the individual Toledots, that uh, they do emphasize, even if they include something of the narrative of the individual himself, 
what the individual brought forth. And significantly, the very first Toledot is not of an individual. Uh, the very first uh, Toledot is of the heavens and the earth. So it's interesting, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. To four, literally, the Toledot of the heavens and the earth, the, the generations, or that which was generated by, or begotten, or brought forth by the heavens and the earth. What did the heavens and the earth produce? Well, they produced the garden in which was put the man. And in that garden, the man disobeyed Yahweh. So the man was put out of the garden. The consequence within the... Uh, uh, the progeny of uh, the man and the woman was further disobedience that brought God's judgment, yet at the end, God provided a son who was the basis of worship of God being restored upon the earth. Uh, 426, then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. That then leads to, to chapter 5, a second Toledot, etc. So what, uh, what did the heavens and the earth produce? What did they begat? What did they generate? Well, they, uh, they, generate, they generated a, a sinful mankind. But you notice how the Toledot of the heavens and the earth goes back to what had originally been narrated. Then the second Toledot. The book of the generations of Adam. Well, we've already heard basically the narrative of Adam, but now what did Adam generate? What did he bring forth? Well, he brought forth death and judgment. Chapter 5, and everyone except one in the line of Adam died, died, died. By the way, do you hear the echo of Genesis 2 there? In the day you read of it, you shall surely die. Now, what did Adam generate? What did Adam bring forth? Death, 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 death. And the day you Israel surely die, 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 die. And not just death, but God's judgment. We've already seen that. The evil that brings forth the, uh, the flood. I will blot out man who have created from the face of the earth. And uh, so, um, so the, uh, the generations of, uh, of Adam produce death and judgment, yet in the midst of death and judgment is one man who did not die and one man who was not judged. That even in this Toledot, that emphasizes death and judgment. Notice we have God's blessing upon a man, in fact, two men who walk with God. Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. And again, in chapter eight, but uh, six, uh, eight, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord and as a man who received God's grace, he goes to the next Toledot, Noah was a righteous man, verse 9, blameless in his days, Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God and was delivered. Enoch walked with God and uh, was transferred from the earth to the presence of the Lord. What did Adam do in the garden before eating the fruit? Chapter 3, verse, uh, uh, verse 8. 
they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, when God was walking in the garden, did what? Hid from his presence among the trees of the garden. When God walked in the garden before they ate of the fruit, what did the man and the woman do? They walked with God. So there are two individuals that in the midst of God's bringing death and judgment upon mankind received God's blessing because they, like Adam before the fall, walked with God. All right, same thing is going to be said about Abraham. Abraham walked with God. So uh, even in the midst, there's an emphasis, as you can see, in this toll out upon God's blessing. Then we already brought this up. The most extensive toll out in the first part of Genesis is the toll out that begins in 6-9, the toll out of Noah. That uh, is going to give us the the account of the flood, and it's very, very basic, very interesting. The flood basically will take away the boundaries established on day three of Genesis chapter one. And as the flood subsides, and then we see the boundaries reestablished, the earth appearing and starting to, to once again bring forth vegetation upon the, uh, the earth that that the very way in which it is described, it is almost like the flood is God's uncreation. And as the flood subsides, we have God's recreation. And then significantly, we have God speaking with Noah in Genesis chapter 9, as we saw last week, in verses 1 and 2, and basically reaffirming what he had said to Adam in Genesis chapter 1. I mean, it's just... the uh, Gentlemen, there's, there's, there's too many echoes, there's too many links that, that you've got to see in, the, in Noah a, a, a second Adam, a, a, a new beginning where God is uh, reaffirming what he, what he said and basically recreating and reaffirming what he had said to Adam in Genesis chapter 1. Yet... In uh, chapter 10, these are the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, what did, um, what did the sons of Noah, what did the sons of the second Adam bring about? Well, very much like chapter 5, verse 1 through 6, 8. So 10, 1 through 11, 9 has the same basic structure. A extended uh, genealogy followed by a short narrative. And a lot of echoes from the, from the chapter 6 narrative to the chapter 11 narrative. Once again, it is emphasizing what is brought forth, what is brought forth is uh, the nations, but the nations now scattered across the face of the earth as in an act of judgment. Not fulfilling God's blessing for them as uh, stated in the, uh, the Noahic covenant, which then leads to finally the, uh, the Toledot of Shem which uh, brings forth Terah, and uh, Terah became the father, 1126, of Abram, Naor, and Haran. By the way, do you, do you notice at that point he lived 70 years and became the father of Abram? Yet he lived 1132 to 205 years, and then Abraham leaves his family in 124 when this took place. Abram was 70 five years old when he departed from Haran. He didn't depart from Haran until after the death of, uh, of Terah. And so Moses, I think, as you add up the numbers, says Abram might be listed first as the progeny of Terah 
1126, but he was not the firstborn chronologically. He's the most important son of Terah. That's why he's first. He's not first because he was the firstborn. And of course, that might help us with the previous men in the genealogy as well. They're there not because they're necessarily the, you know, the firstborn or the or the direct progeny of these individuals, but the most prominent, the most important that is given in the genealogy beforehand. Now, as you take a look at the chart, you say uh, you, you had a hard time lining things up straight, didn't you? And the answer is no. It's there for a purpose. Why is it there for this, uh, for this purpose? Because we have, uh, we've already uh, spoken about uh, the fact that there are some very, very definite echoes that are taking place as far as these uh, Toledots are concerned. Uh, that, uh, yes, they are, once again, discrete individual sections, but they also tie in with what's Moses is doing as far as the text as a whole is concerned. Uh, that there is a sense in which Genesis 1-1 through 6-8 is reduplicated in 6-9 through 11-26. That, uh, that, okay, here is God's creation centered around Adam and his consequences. Here is God's recreation centered around Noah and its consequences that prepare the way. And as you can see, as I put in brackets here, that it's almost like these first 11 chapters of Genesis provide their own introduction to then the second part of, of uh, Genesis. And once again, the important Toledots of, of Terah and the Toledot of, uh, of uh, Isaac and the Toledot of Jacob. Interestingly, interspersed between the Toledot of Terah and the Toledot of Isaac is uh, this Toledot of Ishmael which literally is just one name after another. I mean, it's a literal genealogy. Reminds again of chapter 5, chapter 11 of Genesis. It's, it's basically there just as a historical link. All right, you, you want to know what happened to Ishmael? Well, Israel, let me tell you really quick. This is the Toledot of Isaac. Abraham's son. I, I, I got the wrong one. 11, 19, 11, 12. I mean, 25, 12. Uh, these are the records. This, the, these are the generations of Ishmael. Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. By the way, notice how Moses reiterates. Don't forget how Ishmael came to life. He came to life not through Sarah, he came to life through Hagar. He is not the son of promise, he is the son of the slave woman. And these are the names. And he gives, uh, he gives the names and uh, tells again where they have settled. And uh, they settled in Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt, as one goes toward Assyria. They settled in defiance of all, verse 18, of, uh, of his brothers, of his relatives. He is this wild man that, uh, that, had, been, uh, that had been predicted. So here's Ishmael. And of course, uh, by being in uh, Havilah, which is east of Egypt, as one goes toward Assyria, as one leaves Egypt to go toward Assyria, toward the, the northeast, then he passes through this area that is uh, inhabited by, uh, by Ishmael. And so Ishmael is to, is to the south and to the east 
of the land. So, where is Ishmael? Well, Ishmael is around the, the sons who come through Isaac, uh, Israel, the, uh, the, the nation. And then we have this, uh, this Toledo that introduces us to uh, the birth of uh, Esau and Jacob. And, um, and concludes with uh, chapter 35, the promise being reiterated of the covenant to, uh, to Israel. But before we complete the, you know, and what did, what did Jacob, what did Israel bring forth? Well, chapter 36, with two Toledots. So two times, these are the generations of Esau. And 36, 9, these are the generations of Esau. And particularly, verse 10, Esau's sons. And uh, so basically, in chapter 36, doing more than just Ishmael. This is what happened, you know, with Esau and his immediate descendants, but uh, in chapter 36, Moses adds a second Toledot, which is still the Toledot of Esau, but wants to bring, as it were, the generations of Esau up to the very day to the generation to whom Moses was writing that second generation on the, uh, on the plains of Moab. And why? Well, because they needed to realize at the very end, chapter 36, uh, uh, verse 43, these are the chiefs of Edom according to their habitations in the land of their possession. And the Lord is going to make it very, very clear in Deuteronomy chapter 2 to the second generation, I gave this land to Esau as his inheritance you are not to conquer that. That's the land I've given to him. Rather, you are to go and conquer the land I have given to you. And uh, significantly, what we find in Genesis chapter 36, as, and he too is a son of Abraham, Esau, and God has fulfilled his promise of giving to Esau the land for his possession which is not given to Israel. So Isaac has Israel and, and, and Esau. Esau gets his land, and he's already in his land. As the Torah is completed. As a reminder to Israel that just as that son of Abraham, that son of Isaac got his land, God is in the process of doing what? Giving you your land. So uh, this has great encouragement for Israel as well. And again, they need to know who their close relatives were. Their close relatives through Ishmael, chapter 25, their close relatives through Edom in uh, chapter uh, 36. And then that prepares the way for, uh, for the Toledot of, uh, of Jacob. These are the records of the generations. These are the Toledot. These are the generations. The records of doesn't need to be there. These are the generations. This is what Jacob generated. And what Jacob generated was sons who could not get along. Sons that were disobedient against God, and therefore, because of their unrighteousness, God has to take them to Egypt to be continued. So uh, what we have lengthy of is the, the Toledot of uh, Terah. By the way, it's, it's significant. There's, a, there's an emphasis upon Abraham by exclusion. Adam gets a Toledot, chapter 5. Noah gets a Toledot, chapter 6. Even the sons of Noah get a Toledot, chapter 10. And Shem gets a Toledot, chapter 11. Terah gets a Toledot. Isaac gets a Toledot. Jacob gets a Toledot. Who's missing? Even Ishmael and Esau get Toledots. Who's missing? Abraham. Why doesn't Abraham get a Toledot? 
Well, if you reflect upon that, the end of, of Genesis is saying, what's unique about Abraham? Well, good. Go back and hear Genesis again, and you'll hear what's unique about Abraham. See, see how there's a special emphasis by, by exclusion. You know, why is Abraham left out? What's unique about him? Again, notice what's unique about him is the fact that uh, God has entered into a covenant with him through which he's going to bring blessing to all the families, all the nations of the earth. There's a, there's, a, there's a uniqueness about Abraham that is even reflected within the structure of the book. You can't miss Abraham. I mean, if you leave Genesis and haven't figured out the importance of Abraham, better go back and read it again. And again and again and again till you figure it out. All right, so it's uh, it's a an emphasis by exclusion, and uh, that should remind you at times, gentlemen. Sometimes reflect upon what isn't in the Bible, what is not said, and start to ask yourself, well, why why isn't that said? Um, and uh, sometimes that becomes very, very important to interpretation as well. Now, what I've therefore then done, as far as the outline is concerned, is try to take that basic outline and uh, be more descriptive of how these different Toledos now are, uh, are functioning within the text as a whole. Now, it's significant that we have in the chart these 10 major sections and uh, these 10 major sections of Toledot are divided five in the first major division of Genesis and uh, five in the second major division of Genesis. As I said with 1, 1 to 2, 3 functioning as an introduction to the first uh, part of Genesis and the whole of the first part of Genesis functioning as an introduction to the second part of Genesis. I use the traditional titles that uh, 1 1 to 1126 is the primeval or ancient history. And this is where we have the introduction to the patriarchs and an introduction to the Sinaitic covenants. That is, it shows the need for the Noahic covenant and the need for, uh, the, it describes the Noahic covenant and the need for the Abrahamic covenants. Which together in the second part of Genesis, the patriarchal history, shows the Abrahamic covenants as the means of God's blessings to the nations. That is what have been inferred within the Noahic covenants and now the Abrahamic covenants becomes further the foundation of the Sinaitic covenant, the covenant that God is going to make with Israel at Sinai. Why do we have to talk about the Sinaitic covenant? Because last week we looked at the Torah as a whole and saw that the central theme, the centerpiece and the lengthiest narrative is given in the Torah to Israel's interaction with Yahweh at Sinai. So everything in Genesis is leading up to the Sinaitic covenant. It's to help Israel make sense of what happened at Sinai. So this is an introduction. And... Uh, the, uh, the ancient history introduces us in 1, 1 to 2, 3 to God's creation of uh, the universe, the heavens and the earth, with mankind as the apex, as God's delegated ruler over the earth. God has determined to rule over the earth through man. Can I say it again? Man, God has determined to rule over the earth through man. And even though there is sin, rebellion, disobedience that enters into mankind, God does not 
renounce that determination to ultimately rule over the earth through man and through ultimately a man. Reflect upon Psalm 8. Well, we'll get there in 502. But uh, uh, God has, uh, has, has not reneged. In fact, if we might put it this way, everything from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through Revelation chapter 19 is, is God's is God's working out a plan to restore man to his role as ruler over the earth. And only of ruling over earth through the last Adam. And, uh, and uh, so here we, we see uh, the creation account. What the heavens and the earth produce, we already said, the entrance of sin and the spread of sin among mankind. What do we see in 5, 1 through 6, 8? All right, I'll lose, use the, the word that uh, is used, the corruption of mankind in uh, Genesis chapter 6. We said the predomination of death and judgment but that ultimately through that, God does bless those who walk with him. And then the, uh, the told out of Noah, God's judgment of mankind, we already said an uncreation and renewal, recreation culminating in the Noahic covenant. And then the told out of the sons of Noah, God's dispersion of mankind as nations after the rebellion at Babel, and yet the final told out of Shem, which shows the hope of the nation for God's blessing through a second Noah in the family of Terah, and significantly that uh, just as uh, chapter 5 had, had uh, ended with, with uh, 1, 1, 1, all the way through to the end, and uh, where we, uh, we see at uh, the end of chapter uh, 5 that Lamech, had uh, had a son, Noah, and then son, uh, Noah, verse 20, uh, 32, became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That uh, in chapter 11, Shem, and Shem becomes the father of uh, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And that in... Terah and in Terah's sons will come a, a son, will come a, a hope for the nations just as Noah and his sons took that hope you know, through the judgment of the flood. This, this will be the hope of the nations through the sin that had taken place at, uh, at Babel. And then we have the, uh, the patriarchal history. Uh, Chapter 11, 27 to 25, 11, what really is the, the generation, the Toledot of Terah, uh, Yahweh entering into covenant with Abraham. And after the Toledot of Ishmael, the non-covenantal son, Yahweh's reaffirmation of the Abrahamic covenant first with Isaac, chapter 26, and then with Jacob, Israel, chapter 28, chapter 35, and then the non-covenantal son, Esau, chapter 36. And then the Toledot of Jacob, where we see Yahweh sending his covenant family away from Canaan to Egypt, where they are at the end of uh, the, uh, the uh, first division awaiting then for the narrative that's going to then begin in what we call Exodus. So here is the, uh, the structure, the outworking, and you can see the outworking of the themes that we've been talking about as far as uh, this first discrete section, division of the Torah is concerned, what we call the book of Genesis. All right, so that's the, uh, the overview, and uh, you can uh, certainly, with those two major divisions, concentrating upon the Noahic and Abrahamic covenants, uh, go ahead and uh, trace through what is uh, what is in the uh, 
the portion of the Torah that we call Genesis. And, uh, and you can work through on pages 182 to 184. Um, Dr. Grassani's synopsis of Genesis and uh, brothers, you can do better. All right, and you will do better. So, but uh, you can take his somewhat as a, a, a model.